Yeah. So, Dr. Katonka, welcome. And um, before we allow you to continue, I'd like to introduce you to the speaker, I mean, to the audience. And uh, as uh, usual, we'll be hosting this, uh, we'll be chairing this session myself. Uh, my name is Egina Francis Makwabe. Um, I'm the nephrologist and physician working in Tanzania. I'll be chairing this session together with Dr. Frida Mowo. Uh, she's also the consultant nephrologist uh, working uh, in Tanzania here. So, um, and Dr. Wala, uh, who hasn't joined yet, but uh, two of us will be uh, chairing this question, I mean, this session, um, and later uh, during um, question and answer session. So I would like to welcome you all for today's AHN Nephrology Education Webinar and today's uh, series number 75. And um, let me introduce the speaker before I allow him uh, to continue the presentation. Now uh, today's speaker, um, uh, I have a great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Kotanko, uh, who is the research director at Reno Research Institute uh, in New York and adjunct professor of medicine and nephrology at the ICAHO. Uh, School of Medicine, Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. He's also an adjunct professor of medicine and nephrology, Hammersmith Hospital, UK, former vice chair, Department of Internal Medicine, Graz, Austria. And uh, Dr. Kotanko has authored and co-authored over 360 publications and books, chapters, and holds multiple pat patents in the field of kidney replacement therapy. Uh, he was awarded uh, the KidneyX Prize Innovation in Dialysis in 2019 and 2021. And 20, so, Dr. Tonka, it's a great time to introduce to you, and you are welcome. Uh, we are ready to listen to the topic, the allo hemodialysis, a novel technology to tackle the global shortfall of dialysis. You are welcome, Dr. Tonka. So really, thank you. Thank you so much for this kind of introduction. Just a, a mind thing. So I'm, I, I was at the Hammersmith Hospital and did my diploma in nephrology there, but I'm, I'm not a professor, a junk professor there. So I don't want yeah. to, to put on uh, uh, other feathers on my, I mean, so to speak. And I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm so happy about this invitation because uh, in, in 1981, as a, as a medical student, I worked for... Uh, some about two months actually in Tanzania in a hospital uh, close to the border at, um, at, uh, to Kenya. So uh, close mm -hmm. to Lake Baton. So I've, and this was really an, an experience that lived with me for a long time. And a few years ago, I would go to, uh, to Burundi and to Uganda to, to, to meet colleagues there at, uh, at hospitals. And uh, so this was in, 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 in a series of talks in both countries. So, so this was a, I have, I have very, very fond memories of, of my interaction with, uh, with uh, you, with colleagues from, from that country. And, and the, uh, the topic of my talk today, allohemodialysis, has to do a lot really with, with kidney patients uh, around the world that are, that are suffering because they just have no access to affordable uh, dialysis. Now, let me see if my screen sharing works. Um, so the topic is uh, allohemia dialysis as a novel technology to, uh, to tackle the shortfall in global uh, dialysis. So here, uh, let me just move on. This is my disclosures. I'm an employee of the Renal Research Institute, the wholly owned subsidiary of Fresenius Medical Care. I hold stock in FMC and I receive author royalties from up to date and HS talks. These are uh, educational platforms. Now, the way I think about allohemodialysis is just a means to alleviate the global shortfall in renal replacement therapy. And of course, the question is why would we even need to think about alternative approaches to? Current uh, kidney replacement therapy, and and uh, when I when I traveled to East Africa, I was alluding to this earlier. I, I met actually a patient I just briefly wanted to share her with you. A woman in her fifties, single. She started chemo this about eight weeks earlier because of end stage kidney disease. One to two sessions a week, and the last session was five days ago. And she was clearly when I saw her. Uh, um, fluid overloaded and, and uh, uremic. 
And, uh, and this was her medication, furosemide and antihypertensive medication. And uh, now the, the problem was that she actually ran out of funds to pay for dialysis. So, so the question was really what to do in this situation, right? Uh, and, uh, and I've asked this question to many colleagues at various conferences. And, and yeah, so these are potential interventions increased diuretic therapy, raise funds to pay for renal replacement therapy, follow up uh, later palliative care and something else. So, and I have to say this, this patient, she also stuck with me and, and she's, I still have to think back of her uh, because that's certainly something I have not encountered previously. And, and I mean, these are the options, of course, we know. I mean, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, transplantation, palliative care, or none of the above. So that's where I think the, the, the possibilities. And of course, the question that comes up, is this patient an exception? Is this a unique patient? And, and uh, I mean, it's not. And uh, it's, so this is just some quote from, uh, from David Harris uh, from the uh, Global Kidney Health Atlas, where I said, well, it's projected that in 2030, 15, uh, uh, 14.5 million people will have end stage kidney disease, and yet only 5.4 will receive uh, treatment because of uh, economic, social, and political factors. And, and this is a figure, I modified it slightly by adding these errors uh, from the Global Kidney Health Atlas. So when you look between 2010 and 2030, uh, here in blue, the number of patients actually will receive uh, kidney replacement therapy. But here see in orange, the, the, the segment that's actually, that we needed. And you can see the gap is actually widened over the, over the years. And in my mind, this is just a, a human catastrophe, just a human catastrophe that's not really that recognized I, and doesn't find uh, a lot of publicity, I would say. Now, just when you compare this number here, say we're talking about uh, 8 million maybe in, in, in 2020 or so, when you compare to other illnesses, I mean, uh, it's, it's just, it's just mind boggling to me. And, and uh, so these are there on the bottom, the COVID numbers from, from yesterday. And, and, and I mean, it's, uh, as you know, it's primarily in the, in the low income and lower middle income countries where, where patients uh, that would need access to, to kidney replacement therapy don't have access. I mean, a very small fraction. And you see, of course, the disparity around the globe in terms of patients per millions who receive, uh, who receive treatment. But it's not only in, in, in low and middle income countries. I mean, I, this is a, from the New York Times in, in 2020, where the dire need of kidney dialysis, you won't believe it. We ran short of dialysis space. And there, was, there were even battles, uh, there were even uh, dramas that patients just couldn't get dialysis. And, and like, this, uh, like this young man holding a picture of his dad who passed away because there was no dialysis available. So uh, in, in, the, uh, in a, a Lancet paper, it was very clear that the number of people without access to renal replacement therapy will remain substantial and there is a need to develop low cost alternatives. And so uh, we started and actually this happened interesting enough while I was traveling with my family, Ghana, my, my daughter was working there as a, a physician. Uh, and, and just to think about What's really necessary for hemodialysis? What do we really need? It's vascular access, dialyzer, blood lines, dialysate, pumps, energy, priming, rinsing fluid. So these were, these were the, these are the quintessential things that's needed for, uh, for hemodialysis. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you all know there is, we, I mean, there's the patient connected to the dialyzer dialysis machine, and there is a complex water system. Uh, and, and this complex water system is, of course, technically challenging and it's expensive. So what we were thinking, what if we replace this complex water system with a healthy human being that we just call body? So in other words, that the blood from the body would flow counter current to the blood of the patient 
and and solutes and fluid would move over to the healthy body, and the body just would excrete those solutes with uh, with uh, through his or her healthy kidneys. So like. Um, Solutes would flow actually in both directions following uh, concentration gradients. Like, uh, like uh, solutes, electrolytes would flow here. Fluid, of course, needs hydrostatic gradient. Bicarbonate, on the other hand, water, soluble vitamins, amino acids would flow into the other, into the other direction. So this is the, the fundamental concept behind allo hemodialysis. By the way, why is it called allo? allo a-L-L-O, that's uh, a term from Greek, and it means the other. So because you would need another person in this case. Uh, so that's why we, we just called it l hemodialysis. Now, I mean, it goes without saying that, that something like this, I mean, there are millions of questions, of course, that come up. And, and after, uh, after I, I, I had this idea, my first uh, I mean, I had two things. First, I, I thought we need to look, is this even on paper theoretically possible? And, and of course, uh, one question was, would this be even adequate, you know? Or is it just some crazy idea? And, and then of course, other questions, vascular access, blood flows, blood leaks, body effect on the body, anti provision membrane type, dialyzer or bloodline reuse, what's the psychological dynamic between patient and body? So um, at Renal Research Institute, we do a lot of mathematical modeling. And so uh, the first thing was that I would uh, ask an, a, a real expert in this field, uh, Dr. Vaibhav Maheshwari, to build a mathematical model of allohemodialysis where you have, without going into the detail, where you have a patient here, the dialyzer, and you have the body here, uh, and you have those uh, countercurrent flows of the blood, uh, and and of course your generation rate and so on. So this was built on a previous publication, and what we saw is the following. Uh, so here on the left side, uh, it's and we presented this at various conferences. Uh, so. Uh, here on the left side, you see a situation where we assume that the patient was a child, say 20 kilogram, and the body was a 70 kilogram adult. So here you see in, in blue, uh, or maybe, maybe I should go in yellow here, you see the urea change uh, with conventional dialysis in that case, right? Uh, in in uh, blue, you see the urea change with allohemodialysis. And in this reddish color, you see what would the urea concentration in the body look like? And here, this is just some, without getting too much into the details, how many treatments would be necessary. And, uh, and I have to say, we run literally hundreds and hundreds of simulations just to get an understanding of, of adequacy. And we can say, well, in uh, in, in children, maybe three treatments, four treatments a week are, are sufficient to achieve a, a standard, a weekly standard KTOV that's deemed uh, sufficient. And um, and so, and, but we also did was to look into this, um, was presented 2019, to look into the uh, time course. And of course, you see these typical sawtooth pattern of, uh, of urea both in the patient and the body, but you see the time averaged concentrations here. Now, what would be the situation in an adult? It's the same graph here. And, uh, and I mean, you see that, um, that uh, the same time course of urea and, and, and with conventional and with, uh, with allohemodialysis, the change in the body. But again, this change is only transient, of course, because it would go back again, right? And then go up and go back again. So in an adult, um, one, one may need uh, four dialysis sessions a week or, or even five. It's uh, depending very much on the, on the volume relationship uh, between patient and body. Now, after we have seen that, at least on paper, in theory, it's possible to do this. Uh, my, my next step was to reach out to a, to a medical ethicist. 
Because, of course, I mean, that's a question. Is this even ethical to think about something like this? And I reached out to, to Professor Nicholas Stenick, who is a highly accomplished mental ethicist. And, and this and the next two slides are from him. So I didn't make changes here. So uh, the first question he addressed was, are there compelling ethical reasons against further research? There may be topics where people say, no, you, you must not continue research. It's just unethical. And, uh, and in, in a nutshell, he says, no, actually, uh, there may be even an ethical mandate to explore, uh, to explore uh, alternative techniques. So he says there's no compelling ethical reason against future research. Now, the second question he addressed, if LOHD offers an effective option for renal replacement therapy, can it be used ethically? And he said, and this is this slide is now about two years old, something like this, uh, that uh, the final judgment will depend on the outcome of research findings. That's, that's the, the key statement he made. Uh, so yes, move on with research. If it can be used in humans, show me the data, that kind of thing. And, and just um, in, in late 2021 and early 2022 in January, uh, I asked him to, to convene a larger group of medical ethicists to think about this again. And, and I, our RI was totally hands off. Uh, I, I, we have no influence on, on who he would approach. As a, so we, we, we just were really hands off. Uh, these people were not paid a cent. Uh, they just uh, did this for, as a work of love. And there, and, and uh, you see the three, three colleagues, Nick Stenek, Van Zeta from, um, from New Delhi and Marit from uh, Amsterdam. And they, I mean, you can see the summary here. So this slide, it's actually the first time I showed this slide to an external group. It was created maybe uh, four weeks ago. So they identified no major ethical concerns that suggest that uh, LHC research shouldn't continue. And uh, when sufficient animal research has been conducted, they give confidence that the procedure is deemed reasonably safe then um, uh, clinical trials could be the next step. Now, in the meantime, something interesting happened. So when I, when I gave a presentation on LOHD at some conference, there was a colleague from, from Mexico there and um, uh, Campos Israel. And, and I, I knew him, and, uh, but he on his own, uh, without me actually knowing this, uh, was very interesting. He he started to ask uh, uh, patient caregivers and um, and um, nephrologists what do they think in principle about the uh, LOHD and they published this uh, two years ago. And this is just uh, one of those one of the questions. So question was: Do we agree with the LOHD procedure? And uh, and as you can see the uh, out of 33 caregivers, some more than 85% said, yeah, I agree. Non-related, I think this should have been related caregivers, that 90% said, yeah, that's fine. Healthcare professionals, two-thirds, about two-thirds said, yeah, looks, uh, looks good and I would agree with this procedure. So, so this was very interesting for me to see that, uh, that uh, actually a, a formal questionnaire uh, would result in. Now, next was, of course, technical questions. Now, this is, of course, uh, some of our strengths. And, uh, and so I, I can tell you, it wasn't, it didn't take years or months. It really took only weeks to build the first prototype. There were a few, uh, how should I say, technical um, guidelines, uh, like, um, the machine has to use almost exclusively uh, products that are already available. So no new development of any hardware necessary. Uh, second was that 
no no sophisticated electronics in the in the device. The device would communicate through an app with a phone or with an iPad, but which um, which also reduces the cost because many people just have the smartphones. So um, what uh, what was done? Such a prototype was built. Even the prototype, even the prototype was around 1,000 US dollars. So you can imagine when this is built on a large scale, the, the cost for such a machine will drop to a few hundred dollars. So, but uh, the prototype has more sensors in integrate because we want to learn more about the treatment. And, <clears throat> and so this prototype was built by FMC partner in China, in Shanghai, was shipped to the Renal Research Institute. And there at the Renal Research Institute, we would run uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of tests. Here you see one of those tests with, uh, with blood that spiked with, uh, with uremic solutes and a quotable patient bucket. And we would study the kinetics of a number of, um, of solutes um, creating your uh, protein volume substances and so on and so forth. And, <coughs> sorry, and I can tell you uh, that uh, the results matched almost exactly what we would have predicted from mathematical modeling. So we felt really comfortable about this. Now, one concern is of course infection between patient and body. So what viral infection, for example, right? So we looked into, uh, okay, what is the size of viruses relative to the to the, um, to the pore size. And as you can see, uh, even the smallest virus, parvo virus, is larger than, uh, than the, the membrane pore sizes. So, so they wouldn't go through the pores. <clears throat> of course, the other question is, what about blood leaks, right? And, uh, and so we, we looked into this. And, uh, and we asked some internal people and he would say, well, there's one blood leak per 1 million treatment approximately. Um, a, a quality director at FMC said, well, there's eight complaints per million. And then we went to the FDA MODI database. That's a, a database that collects all these sort of events. And, uh, and, and we, we looked into a period of, uh, of three years, and uh, there was uh, 281 blood leaks reported. So this is about 1.2 blood leaks per million hemodialysis sessions. So it's a, a rare event. So something, it's certainly taking all of this together, less than 10 leaks per million or one per 100,000. Now this was also, of course, important. Now, while, while we were working on the technical aspects, um, of course, the question came up, what, how could you even deliver this? What are economic and care delivery models? Mm -hmm. and, and we see there is actually three use cases, like with disasters or the military, uh, where, um, where uh, you know, primarily in the setting of acute, uh, also most acute kidney injury, but also care for end-stage kidney disease patients. Uh, that in, in areas that are affected by, by disasters or war. Uh, acute kidney injury, and of course also end-stage kidney disease. And uh, just to give you an idea briefly about what, how many patients are we talking about? <clears throat> well, uh, in, uh, in, with uh, worldwide unmet need, it's uh, with acute kidney injury, it's around, I say 1.3 to 1.7 million who die annually, absent dialysis. It's very hard to get this kind of data. This is something I got from the International Society of Modalysis Conference. And this would be, of course, treatment period of days to weeks. So a major question is, of course, what kind of vascular access would the patient and the body have here? Well, I guess with acute kidney injury, it would be uh, central venous catheters, peaks maybe, but... Um, with end-stage kidney disease, we already spoke about the numbers here. Uh, six plus million patients die because there's no treatment. 
And of course, the time horizon would be days, for example, bridging to transplantation, other, other dialysis mortalities, two years possibly. And there, vascular access, everything is on the table. And we and, uh, and we also connected with groups that they create AV fistulas for other reasons, for non-kidney reasons, and, and also looked into their experience. So, uh, so this is just uh, potential use cases. Now, when it comes to care delivery models, this was so interesting. I presented this at a number of conferences in, in, uh, in the US, in China, in India, in Bangladesh, in, in, and uh, multiple conferences, uh, also in Europe, of course, <clears throat> and it was very interesting to see what the kind of creativity people developed. They would come up to me and say, hey, Peter, we could do uh, Air HD. And I, I, when I said, what Air HD, what's that? And they yeah, like Airbnb. And, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that I'm endorsing this. I, I am showing this rather to, uh, to show you that people really start thinking about this. How could this be? Be, be used and put into practice. And there is, and there is one point a colleague at the conference in China, in Chengdu made, he said, look, Peter, this could be uh, a bridging technology to grow a patient population up to a point that it makes sense to implement a traditional kidney replacement therapy. And I'll come to this in a minute. What's very interesting for me was when we researched uh, how many dialysis facilities are available and what's the variability between countries? And here you see on the excess is the population number in thousands. In the US, it's about one dialysis facility per 50,000 population. Now look here, uh, India, there is a, a, a city, uh, Rajani, where there's one dialysis facility per 86,000 patients. But on average in India, there's one dialysis facility for 1.5 million patients. And there is, you see, other in daily, it's one dialysis facility per 139,000 patients. So you see, uh, same here with Bangladesh. Uh, and you see there is a huge, huge uh, uh, range, even within a country. And, and this actually was very interesting. and. Uh, to, to observe and to learn. And, uh, and so what we did then, stimulated by the idea of this Chinese colleague, he said, you know what, in China, we have cities with 150,000, 200,000 population. There isn't a single dialysis facility and patients are just not treated when they have, uh, when they have instage kidney disease. So what we did here in a model was to take such a, city, 150,000, uh, with uh, the ESKD incidence that, uh, that's reported, uh, assuming a mortality rate without kidney replacement therapy of about, um, of about 90%, they also based on literature. And here we even just estimated maybe LOHD has 30% mortality. I mean, we, we just don't know, right? And this is very interesting. On the, on the graph here on the right, you see, this is time in months. This is the number of patients. So in a city like this, at every point in time, there is two patients with uh, instage kidney disease. Now, when you start treating those patients with LOHD and this under these assumptions, the number of patients would grow and grow and grow. And then of course, level off. But up to a point where suddenly it may make sense, to say, okay, let's start a conventional PD or a hemo program or and or transplantation program. So I think that so this was very important uh, to see and, and quite insightful. Then of course, the question was, does this work in animals? So we are collaborating with, um, with the Rinchi Hospital in Hyderabad in India on, on animal studies in pigs. So, uh, so uh, we had, two phases. In the first phase, we only wanted to understand the, is it even feasible? Does this work? Are there any immediate safety signals? So we had two healthy pigs connected through the LOHD machine. And, um, and here's just the pigs uh, prepared for cannulation. Of course, they have to be anesthetized. And, um, 
And so we, we ran a series of uh, 12 uh, studies and we didn't see any, any safety signal. The LOHD worked as expected. So in the next step, in a phase two, we, we would uh, functionally nephrectomize uh, one animal, the, the, the patient pick. And, and you see, we, we, we are doing this, say, through, uh, through uh, ligation. So you see here, fun, uh, of course, well perfused kidneys left and right. And then this is the angiogram after, after ligation. So this uh, on, on both sides. So, so this is what, uh, what we did. And uh, yeah, okay, that's just another one. And this is the setup. So we have here a, a body pig and a patient pig. Here you see the, the um, LOHD machine. <clears throat> and these are, the animals are connected through the LOHD machine. I'll share with you now. And again, I haven't shown this at any conference before. Um, there is, uh, what, what uh, does urine creatinine look like? So, you, so here you have patient one, body one, patient two, body two, patient two, body two, and so on. And you see here in blue, the, the patient pick, and here in, the, the, in red, the body pick, and you see here immediately urea would increase right in the body, but it would decline again, right? Because it's excreted, and you see here the decline in the, in the patient pick. Here, this is another, another patient body pair right after surgery. And you see there is there's no real change because there's hardly a gradient between here. But here again, you see uh, in a, a, a few days later, I think it was two days later, uh, again, in the patient, the urea would decline and uh, urea increase in the body, but then it's, it of course declines. So, so these were very encouraging find. The same dynamics can be seen with, um, with uh, creatinine, of course. So again, it, it seems to work as, as anticipated, as modeling would have suggested. Uh, one question, of course, that came up is there an increased risk of hemolysis because, because um, uh, the, there is uh, blood flowing in the dialysate compartment, right? Uh, and and we, we couldn't find any, any uh, hemolysis. So, so these are ongoing studies. And, um, and so far, LOHD seemed to work as predicted. Now, there is something else when it comes to LOHD. I mean, as you know, conventional hemodialysis uh, requires a lot of water, right? Um, two, 300 liter uh, per dialysis treatment, depending on the rejection rate of the uh, reverse osmosis system. And LOHD doesn't need water. And so we think that this actually, I mean, these are areas where, where severe water scarcity is projected to happen. And so, so we think that uh, this actually could also be an, an opportunity for LOHD. But just to be clear here, we, we don't think that we, we want to replace other treatments. No, no, no. It's just, um, it's just that instead of neither of the above, we want to give healthcare providers, uh, um, patients the choice and say, well, maybe this is an alternative. But you know, there is really the big elephant in the room here. And I, I start eluding this too. The question is, is affordable kidney replacement therapy a universal right? I think that's, that's a really important question that hasn't been that well addressed. And, and if, if there is agreement that it's a right, so if so, how does society provide this care? And I strongly feel that access to affordable kidney care dialysis is a right. And that societies just have to make sure that people can have access to affordable uh, kidney replacement therapy. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's part of what drives us to make to help getting more people access to affordable kidney replacement therapy. And just a brief summary uh, here. So so well globally, uh, as I've shown, millions of patients die prematurely every year because they have no access to affordable kidney replacement therapy. And this is getting worse. Uh, and. LOHD has received encouraging reception by medical ethicists, nephrologists, and caregivers. Uh, we, 
we are not able to identify any insurmountable material technical problems so far. Uh, then, well, uh, there are these bench tests in the, that are underway, uh, underway yeah, in, in the, those pics I've shown you. And uh, it's very clear that care delivery models need to be tailored to local circumstances. So we started, for example, in great detail India, and even uh, uh, within, uh, and there are many states, as you know, and even within the state, there is, the situation is very diverse locally. So this needs to be tailored according to this. And what we're also doing is to explore uh, LOHD use for other use cases. Uh, so uh, like severe neonatal jaundice and, and, uh, and uh, you are for sure aware with this, it's uh, an illness where excessive bilirubin uh, production um, is, um, can cause, a, can cause a brain damage and even death. And, and in some countries, uh, uh, Kernicterus is the leading cause of deafness uh, in, in, in children. So we are, we are exploring LOHD for that. And there is an entire team comprising of nephrologists from, uh, uh, from uh, US, Canada, UK, uh, Austria, Sudan, India that look into this. And I didn't bring a slide with me, I just realized I should have done this. So what was done to develop really miniaturized hardware that, that would allow uh, also the treatment of, of newborn children. So, so yeah, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. And of course, you, you all know, pulling something like this off takes a village. And, and, um, and these are just some of the colleagues I, I have the pleasure and honor to work with. Uh, and, and this whole idea was socialized with over 100 nephrologists worldwide. And I've just indicated the countries here where we have reached out to and, and had discussions with. So, uh, so as you can see, uh, uh, most continents are represented here. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm, I'm so much looking forward to our, uh, to our discussion. And, and you know, there's one thing I've learned, certainly in my, in my research life, that many people think success looks like this. It's a straight path, but in reality, it's not. It's a, it's a back and forth and back and forth. And that's what it really looks like. So, so I, I stop here and really thank you so much for, um, uh, thank you so much for your um, attention. And I'm really looking forward to, um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation and to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Contanko, for the wonderful presentation, eye-opening, especially from Sub-Saharan Africa. I think you know that uh, a few number of people receive renal replacement therapy because of uh, affordability. So before I start to uh, convey questions from the audience, I just wanted to know, is this, will this be affordable? Yeah, so, so we, did a, we did a detailed, and oh, I'm so sorry, I have all sorts of stuff open here. Uh, can, can you see, I still see my screen or? Yes. Oh, here, stop sharing screen. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So we did an, um, and, and really thank you for the question. So we did a detailed analysis uh, for India, where we looked into the cost for disposables and so on. So it's, um, it's around 13 US dollar per okay. treatment. Cool. That's, uh, that's, uh, that would be the cost, yeah. Which is, but this is uh, when, you, when you consider the systemic system costs for dialysis in India specifically, uh, it's much higher. It's in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 US dollars. So, um, so that, yeah, so it might be, it should be affordable to a larger proportion of, uh, of patients, we hope. I agree because here in Tanzania, it's around a hundred dollars per session, more or less. One, 100 US dollar? For hemodialysis, yes, okay. around that. Yeah. Okay, no, that's, that's so important for me to know, I, because I really don't have these numbers and, and I'd, I'd love to learn more 
about this from you. I mean, you're, you're the experts, it's not me. You, you, you are there on the ground. And so that's, that's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you. So I'll start to read questions from the chat box, then I'll move to the question and answers. And to the audience, if you'd like to comment or to talk, please use the raise hand and then I will invite you. So our first commenter from our attendees is from Ben Lomatayo. He's saying, excellent idea. I saw patient body and dialyzer, but it's not clear the requirements for allo dialysis. Is water system replaced by body? Is the body subjected to invasive procedure like the patient? Who should be the body? Okay. Are you changing the body with another one? Where is it done? Oh, oh this is, is, this is uh, uh, a pen. I hope it's okay that I stay first. And that's a, uh, you are really spot on with these questions. So let me, let me go through them. What, no water, uh, uh, water system is replaced. Yes. Um, so, so no water needed. Uh, then uh, the body is subject to invasive procedure. Yes. So the body would need a vascular access. And it depends very much on the patient. Say, for example, if the patient is a small child, say a, a three or four year old child, then the blood flow doesn't need that to be that big. So it could be a peripheral vein, for example, with a blood flow of around 50 ml per minute. If the patient is a, is a strong adult guy, we need higher blood flows, 200 ml per minute, something like this. And in that case, the body would need a, a solid vascular access, yes. Uh, now, who should be the body? Very good question. So, so virtually every nephrologist I spoke to said the following, Peter, when you start using this clinically, uh, you should start in children with acute kidney injury because most parents, most uncles and so on in a family would be willing to serve as a body for that child. And, uh, and so, so yes, it could be, it could be, um, it could be relatives. Interestingly enough, the, one of the ethicists brought up, well, uh, bodies could be paid for their service, right? So, um, and something I personally, uh, to be honest, had not thought about, but this was brought up by the ethicists because they say, look, the body is taking uh, honors on him or herself. And in our society, many professions are paid for, for taking on risk, say. And so, so that's a possibility, I think, this whole concept of of, uh, and yeah, it, it could be different bodies. Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be done at home, yes. And it could be done in a center, so yes. So I'm not sure if I was able to, to answer those the really excellent points. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, from Rajinda Bhima, in pediatric patient, is the dialysis treatment shorter than in adults, given the smaller body size? Yeah, very good question. So, so um, it, it can be shorter, yes. So we, we usually in our modeling assume a treatment time between three and four hours, and then would calculate, oh, how many treatments are needed uh, uh, in order to attain a, a weekly standard KT overview of uh, 1.8 or greater. But, yeah, but yes, of course. So when you shorten the treatment time, um, you may need more treatments. I mean, we, we, we have, all the mathematics worked out, so one could calculate this. So, yeah, but uh, but yes, in 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 kids, in kid, pediatric patient treatment time would be uh, would be there would be less treatment time per week. Thank you. So Rafia is asking in Tanzania, does the insurance cover the cost of dialysis? I think I can answer this one. Yes, it does, but again. Um, for a certain number of people. And I can say less than 10% have insurance covers for health in Tanzania. So we have a lot number of people who cannot access these healthcare uh, facilities or services due to they don't have the health insurance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, it's it's the same situation in India country as I said that we studied carefully uh, about, uh, 
10 out of 100 patients who would need dialysis don't receive dialysis. Out of those 10 patients who get dialysis, I think the number was four, or was it six? I, I think it's four out of those 10 have to stop dialysis within a three to six months. And they are, they, the patient and the families are mostly bankrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so that's, I mean, that's the other part of the tragedy, of course. Yeah. Okay, no, no, so now we move to question and answer section. Um, anonymous attendee is asking, have you considered a model where instead of another human being, the body donating kidney function is an animal? This is such a good point. Actually, when I presented this in the US for the first time to a group of maybe 25 nephrologists, one would say, can't you use an animal? And actually, I have not in my wildest dreams thought about that. But um, I received an email last night from a nephrologist who was asking actually the same question. It was last night. And, and he would say, oh, can't you use a, and, and how do you call it, um, uh, uh, some caregiver animal? So the, the, I forgot the exact term he used. And I think in theory, yes. However, there is, uh, we, we clearly need to think more deeply about this. Uh, I mean, these have to be very peaceful animals that would, you know, keep quiet or, or won't move around, say, during three hours uh, of dialysis. Um, I, I, to be honest, I, I really need to, now that you are also asking this, and the colleague was asking yesterday, I, I, I really need to think about this way more. But um, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Okay. Um, another question in the question and answer, and then I'll go back to the chat. I can see more people are already asking. Vivian is saying, Dr. Kotanko, excellent talk. And I'm very excited thinking of the impact Alo HD can make worldwide. Congratulations in this amazing work. Thank you. I have a question related to the potential effect of uremic toxin body, considering their chronic exposure to that. Do you think they can have any problem along their lives with that? Thanks again. Greetings from Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. So what I tend to think of is the situation where a, 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 a healthy human being would donate one of his or her kidneys. And, uh, and then this kidney is exposed throughout 24 uh, seven to an, to, to the an increased load. So in other words, the, the toxin load per nephron is constantly higher. With LOHD, it would be only intermittently. So, um, so I would think mm, that this is less a problem than with life donation, except there is one thing uh, that, uh, when, when, like, like in a in a kidney donor, when this person would eat, say, a really super potassium-rich food, right? The potassium level may go up transiently, and the same I would expect also with LOHD. But that's something a healthy kidney should be able to deal with. And and I think about this in the context of a set as of a, of a an, an kidney donor. So Daniel is asking, is there a minimum GFR suggested for the healthy body? Oh, the, this, the GFR has to be normal. So I would think uh, the usual number of 120 ml per 1.73 square meter. Okay, Dr. Said from Tanzania is asking, in case of animal, is general anesthesia not affecting the patient? No, I, I think in animal, uh, yeah, I, I, haven't, I really haven't thought this through, uh, to be honest. So um, I, I think if there, if there is real general anesthesia, it, it wouldn't work. So you would need a, an animal that's really so peaceful. I don't know, like, I mean, I had a St. Bernard's dog, you know, many years ago, and this was just, she was so kind and peaceful. Maybe she would have been, you know, served and, and yeah, I guess so. But um, yeah, this repeated anesthesia of animals isn't, doesn't do good for them. So 
yeah, I'm, I, yeah. Thank you. Judith from Uganda is asking, uh, so will the blood of the patient and the body mix or it goes through another filter? What would be the risk of cross blood borne infection between the two? Yeah, How yeah. often would the dialysis be performed? Yeah, okay. Is Good it I am sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, the question still continues. Is it some kind of exchange transfusion? Does the body have to have permanent vascular access? Okay. Wonderful question. So, uh, so the, there is, uh, the, the blood would not mix. There is the dialysis membrane in between. Uh, and the dialysis membrane provides a barrier to, to blood cells. It provides also a barrier to uh, to, um, to viruses, so, so there would be no mixing. Uh, then, and, and the may, infections may occur, rarely we think, when there is a blood leak, as I, as I said, there is maybe one per 100,000 treatments that might be infected. So it might be worthwhile, certainly, to test patient and body for, say, hepatitis or HIV and, and, and these things, yeah. Um, then it goes on, how often depends. It depends on the, on the size of the patient. The smaller the patient, the less frequent treatments. Uh, for children, it would be at least three treatments a week with, uh, with three to four hours. For adults, it might be five treatments. So it, it really, uh, but just that's something, that's the numbers to think about. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, permanent mm -hmm. vascular access. Uh, for the body, um, well, I guess if, if a person decides to, to be a quote-unquote professional body, then I think it would make a lot of sense for the body to have a permanent access. In the setting of an acute kidney injury, say with a, a child, right? A real illness gets an acute kidney injury, needs dialysis, uh, a parent serves as a body, then I think that uh, they, they may, both may have a, a central venous catheter, or maybe, maybe um, um, if the child is really small, a, a peripheral by pick. Thank you. Uh, ben Lomatayo is also commenting and asking that um, I'm quoting, I'm afraid the body can be a profession in future. I want to compare this with transplant donor. We say no payment, no pressure, and everything is voluntary. What is your take as ALOHD is contradicting transplant principles? Yeah, uh, so I think that uh, countries may have very different answers to this, these ethical questions. I mean, there are many procedures that are uh, accepted in one country and by one society that are not accepted in another country, another society. Uh, think of, um, th think of, I don't know, uh, surrogate mothership, right? That's that's uh, for gainful and uh, versus versus voluntary or not voluntary versus uh, within families. So it's accepted in some countries, in others not. And so I think it's up to the societies that to make those choices and within their, their, their ethics and moral framework, within the legal framework. So, I mean, I can see a situation where, uh, where, uh, where it's only allowed between family members. I can see a situation where, where the body is paid for it. Like, uh, uh, like uh, in some countries, people are paid for, uh, for blood or plasma donation, right? Uh, so I, I can see the whole spectrum from purely, um, uh, from purely, uh, uh, I mean, it always has to be voluntary, of course, but from, from not gainful and only within families to, to bodies who do this uh, for a living. I mean, I, under, under strict medical control. So I can see a, a whole spectrum there. Thank you so much. So another one before we finish is from Marco. What are the contraindications of ALOHD? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, a, again, a, a really good question. It's, um, so for example, acute kidney injury because of intoxication. 
Um, so uh, as, as you know, of course, there's acute kidney injury because of, of snake bites or, uh, or, or the sort, right? Uh, or other intoxications. Um, so I think this would be an, an absolute contraindication. So because the toxin may get uh, transferred to the, um, to the body and, and to harm there. So that's in my mind, a, a real contraindication. Yeah. Also, Kakai Elijah is speaking on the same side. What are the anticipated side effects of LOHD to the body? Any maximum cycles for the body? Yeah, yeah. So I, I see mainly uh, two great problems with the body. The first is the vascular access, especially if it's a central venous catheter. You have all the complications that come with that. Uh, and uh, maximum cycles for the body, you know, that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, it's like like with a like with a kidney donor, right? I mean, the kidney donor has one kidney for the remainder of his or her life. Uh, I think, yeah, it's very hard to, I, to make statements here. I, I have to, to honestly, that's something really. I, I think we would need to get real experience to see the effects on the body. Uh, and uh, so, yes, so the vascular access, I think, is the main thing. The second is, of course, the psychological dynamics. Why? Say you, you are body for a patient for three months, and thanks to you, the patient survives. And suddenly you say, no, actually, I don't want to do this anymore uh, because of whatever reason. I think this could pose a, a major psychological problem. So, so these are, I think, the two main problems. Thank you so much, Dr. Kotanko. It was wonderful discussion, wonderful presentation. Now I would like to hand over to Dr. Lloyd Vincent, who would like to give a few comments and maybe finalize our discussion. Thank you so much for, for moderating this. Really, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kotanko, for this wonderful session. Um, uh, I have just a few comments. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thought indeed. And I think uh, uh, the, the countercurrent flows between the body and the patient uh, only uh, completely takes away the factor of water. Uh, water, the amount of water needed, the question of regeneration of water that may be needed in dialysis. So you can go really into the periphery and, and you really not, don't need to sit in the cities. And, and the other important thing is actually what you've shown is uh, there is a significant reduction in bacteria. You know, uh, in in term and, and a very good KQ will be 1.5 to 1.7 that you achieve with very low blood flows uh, that I've seen in in your data, uh, and, and all this actually goes to show that there's a very very efficient process as well, which can again be made much more efficient in many more ways. Now, uh, one thing is one question is what is the membrane that you use here? Like, uh, yeah. will it be a silicon membrane? A, a good question. So it's um, so we use uh, currently a dialyzer. It's a nipro dialyzer with a symmetrical triacetate membrane uh, because uh, uh, we didn't go for for asymmetrical membranes so far because we were you know the asymmetrical membranes are more rough on on the on the dialysate side. And we were concerned that this may cause some mechanical damage to the red blood cells of use. Uh, symmetrical membranes. So, so I was just thinking, like um, now we've had, we've got membranes that take off, you know, uh, la, um, high, high molecular weight proteins, like in the myeloma situation. Yeah. And uh, you also, so these sort of things, uh, if, if the membrane porosity and pore size, uh, it can be changed. You can actually even take off the the high molecular weight, or middle molecular weight substances, which actually yeah. long term, con you know, complications of dialysis. Yeah. So you can intersperse this with uh, with hemodialysis as well, and even, even in the regular treatments, yeah. having a few of these to take off low molecular weight protein, that's one yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, a really good point. I mean, there's one thing we saw that actually protein bound uremic toxins are better removed than with conventional therapy, even because on the, on the patient, on the body side, there is also albumin that has free binding sites for yes. protein bound toxins. So, so they were even, more effectively removed because of the albumin on the on the body side. Uh, with uh, and, and of course you're right when it comes to middle molecules between the two microglobulin and others, then we would need to open the boil a little bit. But these membranes are also more expensive. We, you know, we also want to try to be 
uh, to economically. Yeah, but but there is there is yes. we just haven't tried it also. But then I, I think you've also done studies on displacement using yes. uh, pre-filter displacement uh, uh, infusions. Yeah. That's one thing. Again, if your membrane surface area can be modified for adsorption, so that again can remove toxins. So you can actually combine displacement, absorption, yeah. you know, and the modification of the membrane yeah. to actually make the dialysis much more efficient. Yeah. Even with a Nipro, you've shown a very efficient dialysis yeah. in the pediatric population that is possible. One hundred percent right. Yeah, one yeah so, you, so that I think from the membrane point of view, it's really of big benefit. Yeah. And, and probably the long-term complications of hemodialysis can probably be prevented or at least ameliorated with this uh, technique interspersed with hemodialysis or even continuing with this technique in CKD in, in the developing world. And I think where there is no dialysis at all. Yeah. The other important thing I think is the device, you know, the cost of device is extremely important because number one is you don't have dialysate. So you don't have the piston pump. You don't have the flow pumps of dialysate. You don't have the volumetric system that needs to be put in place. You can use flow-based flow sensors for the ultrafiltration. So what are your comments on that? And so the, yeah. literally the cost tremendous. So, so, and, so, and that I think is a huge uh, benefit. So I think uh, like, like ultrafiltration, I didn't go into the details. You may have seen, and I can share the slides with you, of course. I yes. may have seen that there yeah. is, uh, on one side there is two pumps, right? And and the, the hydrostatic yeah. pressure gradient is great. And the other is for the patient side is one pump. The hydrostatic pressure gradient yes. is developed yes. by, yes. by differential speed of those pumps. So it's a very simple, but still yes. high yes. method. Uh, yes. so, so this is one thing. The, the other concerning the membrane, I have yes. to feel like you are extremely forward thinking, very forward thinking. It's exactly so. We are looking into into these kind of membranes, uh, also for also for conventional. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um, um, so. That in terms of cost, I think it could be a huge cost saver. Um, that's one thing. So, in terms of the the blood pump speeds, what uh, if we increase the the you know, the body speed against the patient speed, uh, the clearance again could be much better. I, I don't know what is your yeah. uh, view on that or what point, just, uh, the experiments point. show. Yeah. yeah, so in our experiments, we didn't go over, uh, but oh, in our modeling, I should say, we saw that the increase in the flow beyond yeah. 200 miles per minute uh, doesn't really make a difference. So the, the effectiveness goes up in okay. the lower range, 51 at 120 and so on, but then it flattens. So, so there is no real uh, uh, increase. If, if effectiveness uh, when when increasing the the blood flow beyond uh, 200 in this specific setting. And and what is what has been the thought on the vascular axis in the body? It is a fistula or or, yeah. or would it be a catheter? Yeah. So, so I, I mean, uh, what is? Yeah. So I think in an API setting, it would be most likely yeah. catheter. In in the chronic yeah. setting. I think uh, fistula is indeed an option. So we reached out to several groups that yeah. do arteriovenous fistulas for non-kidney indications, like uh, like for parental yeah. nutrition or um, or in patients with hemoph hemophilia. Uh, they get they some groups, an Italian group uh, builds AV fistulas for infusion of coagulation factors, um, and those groups actually have good experience with AV fistulas. But again, these are not really healthy subjects, right? So, uh, so we think that uh, fistulas in healthy subjects would be an, indeed an option if, if this is supposed for a long term. So coming to your device that I saw on the, on the slides, uh, you've got three, uh, three peristaltic pumps on the device. Right. So why do you need three? Yep. And again, the other thing is you've got two sets of blood sets two blood sets that are used on either side. So you will need safety systems for both those blood sets, uh, systems right. that are there, yes. like the detectors and air yeah. and everything like that. So uh, what are your plans yeah. for that? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, they are in place, they are in place, of course. Uh, and, and the three pumps is the following. One is on the patient side, the pumps, the, uh, the, pumps the, the, the patient blood, right? And the other two are on the body side. Actually, we have changed all this, but it, it doesn't matter. So you think about it, say on the, on the uh, patient side, one or on the body side, let, let's go with the body setup. 
on the body side, the, the arterial pump, so upstream of the dialyzer, is say, running with 200 ml per minute, right? And the yeah. downstream pump on the venous side is running with 205 ml per minute. Then you have an ultrafiltration of 5 ml per minute. Yes. So, so does it make sense? Uh, no, what, what I don't understand is yeah. uh, you have three peristaltic pumps there. So when yeah. when uh, you only need two because you have only two systems there. So yeah. but you will need an ultrafiltration flow, uh, ultrafiltration piston pump to, for the ultrafiltration. So, so uh, two peristaltic and one uh, piston pump. That should do make the system. So uh, so so in, in our set we have three peristaltic pump, one on the patient side and two on the uh, uh, on two on the body side. The two pumps are needed in our setup for ultrafiltration uh, because to, to create a, a hydrostatic pressure gradient across the membrane. Now, okay. I, and I'm not, a bit because they have different uh, blood flow rates, right? Now, I'm not sure if I understood, are you saying uh, you, you would, you're thinking about using a piston pump? Yes, yes. Uh, 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 uh. Because you can measure the amount. Now you have a, a, a flow pump on one side for the for the patient. Uh, uh, on the body, you have again a flow pump. Mm -hmm. Now it goes through the dialyzer, like in the conventional dialysis. You have an ultrafiltration that's set, and that is done that is done by a piston pump because you can measure the amount of fluid based on the pressure that you put in in your flow yeah. sensors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I think. We will need to think this through a little bit more. Maybe that's a separate call, and I, I would very much invite you to join such a call. Um, I'm not sure if the piston pump, I mean, the, 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 it, it would need to be a pump that just extracts an amount of yes. plasma water. Fluid. Uh, of volume, fluid. Yes. So you would need a, a separate filter again. Uh, yeah, okay. It may be, it may be a little right. bit more complex. Right. Oh because yes. You also, you okay. also have okay. more, now. You have an additional disposable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, this is basically a pressure difference that causes ultrafiltration. Again, right. in the conventional system, you have a you have already a filter from the dialysis. You take that water out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like in the volumetric yeah, well, or the flow yeah, system. In this, yeah. case, uh, in this case, with the conventional dialysis, it's easy and straightforward. Of course, because it's water. But in this case, it's yeah. blood. Yeah, yes, blood, blood, yes, got it, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Wonderful. The only unasked question is your, your, your. Uh, in in the developing world, sometimes uh, you know, the viral infections are much more, and so uh, body could be uh, in 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 a problem in that sort of situation. If you're testing for viral infections, is an issue, uh, especially if you're using ELISA of second generation, third generation. Sometimes there can be problems with the testing. So if your testing is a problem, then that can be one issue that I see. That's the only thing I can yeah, point out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, and, and I think that's right. Uh, and uh, I mean, as, as I've shown you, it's not likely that viruses would go through the membrane pores. Blood leaks are unlikely, but this is clearly, uh, if I would think in an AKI setting, you know, where we, maybe it's uh, yes. 20 treatments are necessary. It wouldn't matter, but if someone, is because chances are so small. But if someone is a professional body, you know, then I think um, that the situation is different because a professional body may have, I don't know, 100, 200 treatments a year, right? So, so just to, to manage the risk here, I would think that these quote unquote professional bodies would need, um, would need, um, uh, a, a good medical care, including testing in, in yeah. regular, uh, yeah. uh, regular time. Point. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful session and very, very innovative and uh, and a lot of thoughts. And, and you're in a new path. So there's a lot of new ground that you break, which is very interesting. And as you, as you showed me the figure, the, 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 you know, the circles that you go through and then come back out of it and then solve the problems that come along. Yeah, I... I, I and and I have to say, I'm really grateful for this invitation. And I would love to stay in touch with, with this group because I mean, just the, the amount of questions, these are just wonderful questions right to the point. And you know, I need these discussion partners, you know, otherwise I, I do not want to live in a bubble. I, I, I want to, yeah. 
to go outside of that bubble and, and expose this concept to criticism, to, to real uh, pinching criticism and, and uh, in question. And that's why I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, uh, probably there are ways by which you can reduce the use of the pumps as well. Or I, I, there are, I think, uh, like in, in, in ultrafiltration and cardiology, there are devices there that are available now, which they use then at very low pump speeds. So these are things, right. I think that, thank yeah. you very much. We yeah. hope to stay in touch. Yeah, thank you. And and uh, whenever you have follow-up questions or questions around other other dialysis topics, just let me know. I'm, I, I, I really enjoyed this call. I truly enjoyed it. And it's yes. wonderful. So really thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.